with that out of the way, uh, it is my great honor to welcome Yoshikono here to the School of Information, a super well-regarded, esteemed researcher in security with a bent in some cases towards usable security, something that we are quite interested in here in the iSchool. He's a professor at the University of Washington, Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering, and also associate director for DEI for that uh, unit. And he's a uh, has adjunct appointments in the Electrical Engineering and Information School and the School of Law, so interdisciplinary person after our own heart here. And he co-directs the University of Washington Computer Security and Privacy Research Lab and the Tech Policy Lab, and was a founding member of the National Academies Forum on Cyber Resilience, and is currently a member of the, of the board, right, of the Electronic Frontier Foundation Technical Advisory Board, which is really big. Well, yeah. uh, and the USNIX Security Committee, so, Oh, and he got his yeah. PhD at the University of California, San Diego. So he is a West Coast guy. Mm -hmm. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me make it smaller. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, as Marty said, my name is Yoshi Kono, he, him pronouns. Uh, and it's great to be here uh, and to see all of you. Uh, please feel free to interrupt, or we can talk at the end uh, as you wish. So the title of this talk is computer security and privacy research, the past, uh, the present, and the future. That's a pretty big title for a talk, and how do I might try to fit that all into an hour? So let me step back a little bit and say, what was my vision and my intent with this talk? Uh, I wanted to create a talk that could help those new to computer security research either start to do computer security research themselves or include elements of security research in their own research portfolio. And I believe that an understanding of the past and the present can help us navigate that future. I also didn't want to give a traditional classroom style talk, though this is still a lecture. And so I wanted to draw from what I hope to be some interesting case studies uh, as illustrative examples. Naturally, whether I achieve these goals uh, is up to you to decide. I want to begin by offering a definition of that I learned recently, uh, the world, word parallax coming from physics. Parallax is the effect whereby the position or direction of an object appears to differ when viewed from different positions. For example, through the viewfinder of a camera lens. So imagine here that you have a planet or a research space sitting somewhere in space, and you have two observers. Observer one might say this object uh, is on my right, uh, and observer two might say this object is on my left. In actuality, they are both correct. They're just coming from different perspectives. Likewise, observer one might say this object is blue or this planet is blue, and observer two might say this planet is red. Again, they are both correct, just coming from different perspectives. So with that context in mind, I need to say that this is my perspective on computer security research. Uh, so what is my perspective? I come from the USENIC security research community uh, and in the orbit of IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy, the Symposium on Usable Privacy and Security, Privacy Enhancing Technologies, and so on. You know, we call ourselves the, the core, you know, we say we're you know, core security researchers, but I don't actually know if this word is correct because the field related to computer security is naturally and significantly broader than just the fields with which I am working. And even within the field with which I am working, the research space is much broader. So to help you understand a little bit more about where I'm coming from, uh, I am passionate about exploring the risks with emerging technologies and technologies that may, we may not even see yet, but might have to see in the future. I also like to understand novel risks with existing technologies. I believe it's important to understand the relationship between people, society, and technology, uh, and try to understand what might happen in the future, the future. And also anticipating the benefits and harms of future technologies, even without adversaries present, some new research directions of mine and mitigating the risks. So with that context in mind, what is this talk about? This talk is about my perspective on the past and present, but thinking about the future of computer security. And I hope it'll also come across as an introduction to security research, including my rough categorization of the different types of security research papers, as well as my approach for trying to identify important problems to be working on. It'll be example-based, drawing largely from my own research, 
But again, I want to fully acknowledge that so, so much amazing work uh, by many people at these venues uh, and beyond. So let's begin with an introduction to computer security research. First, by beginning with an introduction to computer security and privacy. I will offer two definitions. Uh, they're all, they're very closely related. Definition one is that computer security and privacy focuses on protecting stakeholders from the intentional failures created by intelligent adversaries. This definition is related to the notion of reliability and usability. Systems might fail accidentally due to reliability issues. When you think about computer security, we think about adversaries who try to force these systems into the worst possible situations, such that the reliability failures become exploitable or adversarial situations. Another definition is that computer security is about computation in the presence of adversaries. Here, sometimes the advers we think about two different categories. Sometimes we think about adversaries who use computation to mount an attack. For example, if an adversary uses face recognition to violate someone's privacy, that we consider that within the scope of computer security. And sometimes the adversary mounts an attack against the computation. For example, they might compromise a system to steal data. Computer security and privacy research focuses on the scholarly in inquiry toward mitigating security and privacy risks with deployed systems. Here's this familiar or from before. Now might come as no surprise that I'm going to say there are different approaches or perspectives on security research. Some security research is focused on the problem. So what is the technology that might have security risks or what might the attacks be or what might the use cases of this technology be? Other security and privacy research focuses on methods or tools. For example, this might be deep and continual analysis on innovating new methods to automatically analyze software or new methods or approaches for applying some cryptographic methods. For the purposes of this talk and for a lot of my research, I am focused on the problem-focused domain, although I want to acknowledge that all approaches are important and valuable. Uh, they are just different. So now let me talk a little bit about the history of computer security. Uh, and in fact, it's, I'm very excited <clears throat> to give this talk in this place because the very first IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy happened in 1980 at the Claremont Hotel, uh, you know, right, right nearby here. That's a very long history. When I think about the history of computer security, I oftentimes think about a focus on computers and computations as the subject of this intellectual inquiry. So there's work on secure hardware, secure operating systems, network security, uh, understanding information leakage between systems and cryptography, and sometimes a focus on specific systems that existed at the time. For example, smart cards. I will get back to that, that last uh, example in a moment. This timeline I wrote is approximate because even though this was maybe a major focus within the discipline, that doesn't mean there weren't exceptions. For example, the very famous Salter Schroeder paper from 1975 talks about psychological acceptability of security mechanisms, hinting at the future of usable security. And even if a lot of the work back then focused on say hardware or operating systems or cryptography, a lot of work was motivated by the vision of helping society. One of the themes of problem-focused research and expanding on my sentence about smart cards is that the research, researchers ask the questions, what are the technologies that are important, revolutionary, or under significant innovation at this time? Or what are these technologies that might meet this criteria in the future? And then the question for researchers are, what are the risks with these technologies and how can we go about mitigating them? If we look through history, example areas of interest included smart cards, sensor networks, web security, mobile phone security, and this, these technology areas continue to, to, to grow and grow. Let me now turn to the more recent past, and by that I mean over the last 20, 30 years or so. The computer security and privacy research field has started to evolve to include more of a study of users, uh, and in fact, an entire field of usable security has blossomed. You can see the paper, uh, screenshot of a paper on the far right uh, uh, with you know, Berkeley, Berkeley authors, also Doug Tiger and Alma Whitten, a very famous usable security paper. 
Uh, the security research community has also expanded to include a study of adversarial actions in the wild. So think, for example, of an internet worm that is spreading across the internet. There, this worm takes, this launches from one computer and tries to infect another computer. By monitoring network traffic, it is possible to understand the shape and properties of this network worm as it, as it propagates. That's a, a studying adversarial examples uh, in the wild. And there's also more and more work on studying what I call non-computer computers. These are devices that people may not think of as traditionally having computers in them or being computational devices, and also start to have more and more interactions with the physical world. So examples might be voting machines or medical devices uh, or automobiles. Again, the timeline is still approximate and the past research directions are still important. Turning to the present, the computer security research field is now realizing that not all users are the same. When we say consider a user, you know, oftentimes people think of the default stakeholder, which may be, you know, a white man, college educated, living in the United States, a United States citizen, at least for studies done here in the United States. <laughs> and so more of the computer security research community has now realized the importance and, and, and criticality of considering specific user groups. Also, there's more and more awareness of thinking about users beyond usability. For example, considering human values and society and indirect stakeholders. For example, a face recognition system might be very usable to the person who is using it, but might impact the autonomy of those in the environment, an example of, of indirect stakeholders. And also continued expansion into new technical areas, uh, adversarial machine learning, misinformation, cryptocurrencies, and uh, most recently, uh, language models. So now the question is, what, what is the future? Uh, and that is up to us. But when I think about the future, the questions that I would not say keep me up, but the questions that I wake up for and that I'm interested in are, what are the important new technologies over the next five, 10, or 15 years? And these new technologies, what might, some, what might their security risks be? Maybe there's risks that we might obviously expect, or maybe there might be some surprising risks, but what risks might these new technologies bring? And what will the, be the relationship between people uh, and oh, with people between these technologies, people and society, if those risks are unmitigated? And then, of course, how can we proactively mitigate these risks before these technologies manifest? So that hopefully, if we do our research well, no one ever thinks about it at all because these technologies provide the appropriate security guarantees. So, in order to try to answer the above there are things we need to do. One is we need to try to find ways to anticipate these technologies. Uh, how do we anticipate the new technologies? How do we anticipate the risks? And then how do we develop mechanisms for that? My talk is largely in this bottom domain, uh, but first, uh, I don't have the answer, but I have an approach, which I wanna talk about. Uh, but first, let me give another detour, again, in my introduction to what my view of computer security research field is the roughly four different categories of computer security research papers. The first category of papers studies risks with present and future technology. Oftentimes people call these attack papers. We take some artifact that people have not evaluated before and we try to understand what the security and privacy risks with this artifact might be. Another category of papers focuses on measuring adversarial actions in the wild. This is what I mentioned before, like monitoring the worm propagation, or maybe looking at Bitcoin cryptocurrency, you know, Bitcoin, the blockchain, understanding uh, e-crime there, or so on and so forth. Uh, study the interactions between technologies, uh, people, and society. And I know we have field leaders uh, in this room working in that, that space. Uh, for example, one of the things we did was we studied uh, people who visit Airbnbs and try to understand their perspective on IoT devices in vacation rentals by owners, you know, where they might want those devices be, where the concerns might have, and so on. And a recent study, we looked at uh, TikTok and the information people share on TikTok about ways of actually protecting or compromising other people's privacy. Um, and then there's work focused on designing, building, and evaluating new systems. 
And roughly almost every paper we review falls into one of these, or at least in my sub, sub area of security, <laughs> falls into these categories. So now coming back to the future and how do we begin by answering those questions? Using this framework as a guide, really one can start probably anywhere. One can start, for example, by studying the interactions of people and technology and use that to try to extrapolate and understand you know, what the future risks and technologies might be. For the purposes of this talk and for a lot of my research, I start with this top box of saying, what new technologies might we see and how can we today understand what the future risks might be so that we can mitigate those future risks before they happen? So we focus there, uh, but of course, all the other spaces are important. And I should say that these spaces are also interacting between with each other. For example, we study risks with new technologies. We understand a new type of threat. We can do a user study or, or interact with stakeholders to try to understand how they perceive this risk and so on. Okay, so now diving a little bit more into this type of paper, which again, some people might call an attack paper, but really it's about some scientific inquiry into understanding the risks with present and future technologies. The first part is to try to anticipate the future technologies uh, or the future threats that we haven't, we don't know about yet. A big portion here is something called threat modeling. So once we've envisioned this future technologies, we use a process called threat modeling, which I'll return to at the end. And if there's any one takeaway for those who are interested in moving into the security space and you're not already in the security space, it is how to think about and apply the notion of threat model, which is basically to understand what adversaries might do. For our academic work, after we understand what adversaries might do, we often experimentally explore and try to understand the actualities of these types of attacks. What might an adversary actually be able to do? Um, and then after doing so, we are in a position to have broader conversations, uh, conversations with, for example, industry leaders and with government. Um, here is one place where I will say, and then you'll see later as, we, as I go through some more concrete examples, that having concrete demonstrations of actual exploit capabilities when understanding some type of future technology or any type of technology can enable conversations that don't typically happen if we say that there are concerns. So for example, long, long ago, I used to work on electronic voting. My memory of the time was that people were saying electronic voting is a problem, it's a problem. But after one demonstrates, look, here are insecurities in a system, people listen in a slightly different way. So we're not gonna actually break this out into like a classroom exercise, but um, an exercise that you're welcome to think about is, and how I think about security research is, what are three future technologies that you are most excited to see manifest? Uh, and imagine them in five to 20 years from now. Uh, describe the technology yourself. Uh, and you know, maybe consider explicitly why you're excited for them to manifest. And another exercise is think about three future technologies that you're most worried about. Uh, imagine them in five, 10 or 15 years and do the same thing about considering them and describing them to yourself. And so you can just start this process uh, if my slides become you know, too uninteresting, uh, <laughs> but regardless, uh, this is a good exercise that I encourage everyone uh, who's interested in security uh, to do from time to time. Okay, so with that broad overview of my of parts of my perspective of the computer security research field, let me give you some concrete examples of what I mean. Uh, the first example is our work on wireless implantable medical devices. We started this work in about 2006, you know, it's now a decade old. A lot of people are continuing to work in this space. But I can give you a little bit of history of how we started this. And by we, uh, I mean an amazing team, uh, Dan, Hel Dan Helper and uh, Tom Hyde Benjamin and Ben Ransford uh, were the lead PhD students on the project. There's Shane Clark, Vanessa DeFinville, Morgan, and the PIs in this project, in addition to myself, was, were Kevin Fu and Bill Maisel. Bill Maisel was a, a cardiologist. The rest of us were security researchers. <coughs> we asked the question: how are medical, why, how are medical devices being innovated today? And what might the future of medical devices be? At the time, we were starting to see increasingly use of wireless communication capabilities on these medical devices. We wanted to understand what the risks were, 
And we wanted to then be able to inform conversations with manufacturers and the FDA and others uh, about what these risks are and how to mitigate them. So we obtained uh, some implantable cardiac defibrillators. We experimented with them. We found that we were able to wires, wirelessly eavesdrop on these devices to observe private patient information uh, if a doctor was interacting with the device nearby, uh, change the settings and actually cause actuation on these devices. Now, at this point, I want to say that the actual risk to patients with our discovery was incredibly low. Uh, you know, these were very early devices, you know, not long range capabilities, you know, so many, so many, and very hard to do this work. So many things contribute to the fact that the actual risk to patients is incredibly low, such that, for example, and these are life-saving devices, such that, for example, if I had a medical reason to get any device, including the one that I studied, I would have no qualms and no reason not to do so. Still, we did find that there was the potential for unauthorized access, and so started conversations with the FDA and manufacturers on figuring out how can we go about mitigating these risks before these technologies become more sophisticated uh, and more capable. Let me give another example, the modern automobile. But this project we started in 2008, it continued uh, roughly till 2016 or so. At the time we started this, the modern autom automobile was already becoming pervasively computerized. Uh, this was before the autonomous cars became you know, such a big thing. But these, all, these cars were pervasively computer, computerized with tens to sometimes hundreds of computers on them. And these computers within the car were connected to each other over an inter one or more internal computer networks. And there's big safety reasons for this. So for example, you might have a sensor on each wheel detecting how fast each wheel is spinning. Uh, that would send a message over the car's internal computer network to another computer that detects if one wheel is spinning faster than the other. If that is happening, it's a sign that the car is entering into a skid. It'll send a message to the brake controller, slowing down like the back left wheel and thereby providing traction control. So big safety reasons for this increasing computeriz computerization on the car. Uh, and, and work again with a number of amazing researchers, Carl Kosher, Alexei Cheskis, Francisco Rosner, and uh, Shweta Katella, UW, Steve Chekaway, Damon McCoy, Brian Cantor, Danny Anderson, Hobab Chachamp, Ch and uh, Stephen Savage at UC San Diego, we embarked on trying to study the computer security properties of cars. Um, our first question was, what might happen if an adversary is able to connect to the car's internal computer network? So they have physical access to the car. So that, what can happen if a car, the adversary is connected to this internal network? To answer this question, we bought two 2009 uh, modern sedans. Uh, we kept one up in Seattle and the other was kept uh, in UC San Diego. Uh, subsequent research has replicated our results on other cars uh, from other manufacturers, uh, the parenthetical, and also we worked a lot with government and the automotive industry to try to understand and explore these defenses uh, towards, again, increasing security of, of future, of today's and, and future automobiles. This figure shows our experimental setup. We have a laptop uh, on the right of the screen, some connectors connecting to the OBD2 port, the onboard diagnostics port underneath the dash. And from this setup, we could communicate on the car's internal computer network. Once we were on the network, we found that we had a, a lot of control. For example, we had arbitrary control over the dash. This is us deciding to set uh, the speedometer to 140 miles an hour while in park. And as any good security project, there's an online advertisement uh, to our project website. That was meant as a joke, sorry. Maybe not that funny, but um, we have the ability to control the dash, the lighting. We can turn off all lighting, the outdoor lighting, all inside lighting within the vehicle. We can you know, start the engine, we control the engine, the transmission, the brakes, the HVAC system, uh, and basically almost everything that was computerized control, we were able to, to impact. One of the things that we needed to do was for those experiments, we had the car up on jack stands, they were experimenting with it in a, in a certain environment. Um, we wanted to know if our discoveries would work on a real car being driven down the road. So we got access to a decommissioned airport runway. And you'll see in this video, Alexei Cheskis driving the, the car. 
uh, again, connected to the car's internal computer network, you know, via a laptop and then more connections, is a computer. And through that computer, packets will be sent to the car. For this particular video, uh, the packets will be sent. Well, and again, if anyone had compromised the internal network, they could send this packet as well, will be to apply the brakes. So let's see. We test it. Two, one, zero, now. Okay, it starts driving. Hit the brakes at three, two, one, will be zero, sent. now. Um, and so, <laughs> one of the questions cool. you might ask is that, really scary, but cool. So, so we sent the packet and the brakes were connected. One of the questions you might ask is, well, why are the brakes under computerized control? Um, for anti-lock braking, you know, if you're supposed to slam on the brake, well, actually it's supposed to be pumping it, which that means that the, the physical <clears throat> braking mechanism is controlled by a computer. Two, one. Okay. Um, we also had the ability to disengage the brakes. Uh, that will be this video. So Three, again, two, be, one, zero. Uh, I'd like to be driving down the road. And we had a lot of safety precautions. Uh, drop this. In fact, police presence were there too, and so Send the packet at three, two, one, zero. And the packet will be sent. I cannot break. Let me try it. Sorry. Yeah, you can't break the, you know, the, the brake pedal. Okay, now I'm a 20. I still can't break. Uh, let me try the efficacy. Let me try the efficacy of the parking brake in case someone actually might be in the situation. And in this particular situation, uh, the parking brake is under reasonable control, uh, so that's different. Three, two, one, zero. Okay. So then again, our whole goal of this work was to try to improve the security of automobiles because we had no reason to expect that adversaries might not develop these type of capabilities in the future. We wanted to get ahead of that head of the adversaries and also work with industry and government towards defenses, you know, happy to talk later about uh, the, the processes for, you know, working with government and so on in this situation. But the next question that we asked ourselves was, is it possible for an adversary to have these capabilities without ever physically touching the car? Okay. Turns out the answer is yes. Um, our car has a telematics unit. Uh, think about GM OnStar or any of the other types of systems that has a built-in cell phone that, for example, has the ability to effectively call 911 if the car gets into an accident. Because our car had a built-in cell phone, we were able to call our car uh, over the cellular network, just call our car's phone number, uh, play the appropriate tones to bypass the in-band, you know, to activate the in-band modem, play more modem tones to violate an authentication vulnerability, more modem tones to mount a buffer overflow attack, which is a type of security attack that got our own code running on the car. Once we had our own code running on the car, uh, the car's telematics unit ran a variant of Unix. Uh, and it, it actually, without us modifying at all, our car off the lot had tools, I think like VI and FTP and a whole bunch of other tools running on the car. So our little bit of exploit code opened up an FTP connection to our servers at UW, which then pushed an IRC client and then we ended up having an IRC client on our car that we could just control over IRC. So in this video, uh, Francie, now another professor at University of Washington, will be talking about uh, our capabilities once we have remotely compromised the car. So in this particular video, we have remotely compromised the car. We have our IRC client running on the car, and Francie is able to type some commands, our theft program, that uh, would start the car, unlock the door, uh, and so on. We're going to steal this car over the internet. This car has an IRC bot on it that will let us communicate with it. Again, this power is already compromised. And, the and then it's just a simple matter of executing the theft program. And then uh, my colleague can just drive the car away without a key. Uh, <laughs> uh, the doors have been unlocked. Uh, so you can just enter. Uh, and then, you know, of course, you know, you'll have to bubble up. Uh, um, you'll notice that there's no key right. in the ignition. Um, we've disabled the ship lock solenoids and just shipped out of park. Here we go. Uh, now, one of the other things that our car had in it uh, is that it had Bluetooth hands-free calling. 
Uh, this means that it had uh, microphones built in within the cabin. We were able to turn on those microphones and stream real-time audio from within the vehicle uh, without any uh, visual indicator. We're going to steal the So this is that last video. Um, <clears throat> this car has been compromised already. Uh, this time by a seat check away, but you can people get into the car. <laughs> King Bowser's gonna be super excited that we finally kidnapped Yoshi. This is their script. <laughs> um, that, that was entirely their script. Uh, meantime, uh, in UC San Diego, you see Steve check away. We're having the GPS coordinates stream from within the car. And uh, Pretty soon you'll start hearing the audio and this audio is recorded within Steve's office. So it is this quality of the audio. So you can see where the car is. And <laughs> King Bowser's uh, gonna be super excited that we finally kidnapped Yoshi. And uh, again, our goal of this research was to understand, and by the way, the automotive security research space existed long before we did this research in the sense that you know, people were talking about automotive security for a while, but the conversation can change substantially when we are able to demonstrate, look, this is what we have found. These are the issues that we now need to work with. And so we, one of the first things we did is we con before contacting the manufacturer even, we contacted the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration and the Department of Transportation saying, we have some things we need to discuss with you. We think it's industry-wide. How do we go about doing this? And some of our results, uh, you know, we didn't make public for, for quite some time. Okay, another topic, uh, just kind of an example again of, of thinking about the future. When we think about the future, it is not just what are the future technologies, but what are future ways that adversaries might use our current technologies. One of the topics of interest we have a, a lot, both Francie and I at the University of Washington, is on security and privacy and online advertising. Back in 2016 or 2017 or so, we, we saw conversations about and ourselves were interested in is, if I were to buy an ad, what information can I learn? And so, for example, imagine a super targeted ad where I say, I want to send a, target to Alice at G a targeted ad to Alice at gmail.com for anyone whose email address is alice at gmail.com and their age is 18. I want to send a targeted ad to anyone whose email address is alice at gmail.com and age is 19. Once I see one of those ads hit, um, I might learn information about uh, alice.com. This wasn't our work. This was kind of conversations we saw uh, existing out there. One of the observations we had was that the online advertising ecosystem was becoming much more integrated with the physical world to the degree of being able to purchase very targeted physical location ads. So for example, if I'm standing outside of a Starbucks and I'm using my phone, I might get a targeted ad for, for that Starbucks or for Starbucks. Now, Starbucks is just an example. I'm not sure who was purchasing this. And so one of the questions we had was, does the online advertising ecosystem basically democratize access to surveillance capabilities. We wanted to know if we could use the online advertising ecosystem <clears throat> or if adversaries could use the online advertising ecosystem to, for example, learn someone's home location or office location or, or frequent places that they might hang out. To do this, we basically created a grid that tessellated parts of Seattle uh, for location-focused grids. And we sent a targeted ad to a specific mobile advertising identifier, the identifier of the PhD student, Paul Vines, who was working on this project. And uh, only, it would only be triggered as an ad for his, his phone. And there are, of course, ways to learn the mobile, the made, the mobile advertising ID of an individual and so on. When an ad was, was shown, not when the ad was clicked on, but when the ad was shown while he was using his mobile phone, we would get a hit for that particular location. And through that process, uh, we were able to, for example, monitor and learn. I mean, he used the PhD student, so he kind of knew where he lived, but he did learn where he lived also uh, through this process and where he worked and so on. Um, this happens to be an example of something that I'm still concerned about and would love to have greater change so that this type of thing uh, is not possible. But again, we explored it because we wanted to have conversations around it, and we got glimpses that, you know, uh, you know, other people also think uh, in, very, in, in these types of ways. 
Um, a little bit more science fiction-y, but I wanted to cover it because I think that it is important to explore risks that may not actually be that important today, just so that we can understand uh, potential possibilities of the future. And this is our work focused at the intersection of basically DNA, computational synthetic biology, and security. So DNA sequencing is now ubiquitously used in a number of different spaces, from forensics to genetic engineering, personalized medicine, uh, and store, and so on. This is an overview of a DNA sequencing pipeline. So imagine that you've collected some DNA. You might prepare it, you know, in test tube, amplify the DNA so there's more of it, and so on. Put it through a DNA sequencing machine. And then that output of that DNA sequencing is going to be read uh, and processed by a computer. The question we had was, is it possible to prepare DNA that when it goes through this pipeline will result in the computer being compromised? Um, that, was, that, was our, that was our research question. So prepare DNA, uh, exploit, you know, Prepare DNA in a certain way that when sequenced and then run on the data machine uh, is processed. I will have to admit that one of the reasons I got, we got this idea was I saw tabloids in my computer is infected by a human virus. And, you know, uh, <laughs> but anyways, this was, this was the, uh, and so meaning the interplay between science fiction and science. Um, and this is an example of our exploit. Our exploit is in this test tube. Uh, it is some DNA. For, for the full pipeline, what we had here is we developed some shell code. This is terminology in the security community for basically code that will compromise the computer. We encoded it in DNA. We synthesized the exploit. We sequenced it. It output a FASTQ file, which is basically a, a, a specific format for some process DNA. Um, we ran it through a, a utility. I'll have to give some big asterisks there. Uh, when it was run through that utility, it compromised the, the computer and open up a, a, a network connection and um, the compromised computer. Some big, big, big caveats here. Um, we, we modified the target program so that it was vulnerable to this particular attack. Why did we do that? In some sense, anyone can compromise a system that they make vulnerable to compromise. And so why did we do that? Well, a lot of our focus was on understanding whether we could pack exploit code into the biochemical properties of DNA. For example, long sequences of a single nucleotide is very weak and would not persist. And so we wanted to look at that biochemical relationship. The big lesson from all this for me though, is not can we compromise a computer with DNA because I think this is still in the realm of science fiction, but more where else might there be unexpected adversarial inputs? and how can we proactively identify them uh, and mitigate those risks. Um, another example of work, and this is still ongoing, uh, with Peter Ney as the lead author, uh, Arka Parachadra, uh, David Ward, Lisa Cheskis, uh, and Jeff Navala as the senior author. Um, other things that we are doing is, many people are probably familiar with uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing, where you like spit into a test tube, you send that off to some service, then it gives you information about your DNA. What we asked was, if an adversary synthesizes their own DNA at high concentrations, can they mix it with saliva and adversarially change some of these DTC results? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, in certain situations. Um, you know, for example, change uh, hair color and eye color, uh, possible also to, if, if for example, uh, insurance or anything is based off of the output of these DTCs, you know, change things that might have uh, medical relevance. Um, lastly, there's something I've wanted to explore, but we haven't. Uh, some of you might be familiar with our earlier work. Again, this is also in collaboration with, with Berkeley, uh, uh, I don't know, um, you know, a number of, uh, of great researchers where we put stickers on a stop sign to make a computer vision algorithm identify the stop sign as a speed limit sign instead of a computer vision sign. I have this theory that it's possible to generate synthetic uh, uh, bioluminescent plants that uh, would fool computer vision algorithms, uh, but we haven't done that. So I've written that up in a short story for science fiction uh, because uh, we haven't done that in our lab. These days, uh, one of the big areas that we are most interested in 
And we, again, the, the other lead PI uh, on this is Professor Fancy Rossner, uh, is the future of mixed reality systems. And we started this around 10 years ago, uh, 2010. So oh, more than 10 years ago. One of our challenges was convincing people that this was actually a really, actually an interesting problem to work on because at that time, and even still some today, they seem more like science fiction than reality. But these are technologies that can sit between us and the real and the physical world. And for example, my overlay content, uh, you know, example that people have said is like, you know, overlay maps. So I can just walk around and I can see the direction that I'm supposed to be heading or you know, people's names and so on. Um, there's this one famous YouTube video that talks about what the future world might look like if we were all wearing these glasses, basically, you know, pop up ads uh, to the extreme. What we wanted to think about and understand were what might the security issues be with these types of uh, immersive technologies and how can we go about mitigating them? Um, so here we have, a, and you know, automotive manufacturers are working on this also, but here we have a mixed reality display on the hood of a dash showing information like the speed limit, uh, the speed, you know, information about the environment as one is driving down the road. And if we were thinking about a multi-app environment or even a single manufacturer, but with multiple product teams, one question might be, is it possible for some content to accidentally or adversarially obscure other critical content, such as the speed limit? Uh, or is it possible for this virtual content to obscure important properties of the physical world? And, or is it possible to disrupt the user psychologically, for example, by startling them? So I have an animation of a spider, which would startle me if you don't like spiders and close your eyes for just a second. But uh, if a spider shows up uh, while driving, uh, you know, what was someone's immediate reaction? This intersection between the brain and uh, these mixed reality devices, I think is really fascinating, really important and really challenging. So the next slide I will show you is something, the, the inducing slide for the McCullough effect. Some of you might know this already. Some of you might not. Um, the next slide, I'll show it only briefly, uh, but feel free to close your eyes if you wish. Uh, for the McCullough effect, I'll show you two, two images, one consisting of black and red patterns and the other consisting of black and green patterns. And the, the induction procedure is you stare at the image on the left for a few seconds and stare at the image on the right for a few seconds and then repeat for a few minute, minutes. And then you look at a test image that only has black and white stripes and you'll actually see color. This is known as the McCullough effect. So I'm gonna advance it, but just very briefly, feel free to close your eyes if you want. Um, these images are from Wikipedia, by the way. Uh, so this is the pro these are the, the in inducing slides for the McCullough effect. Okay, and then this is the test image. So I've, I've moved past that slide. Um, and after induction, the space between the vertical lines should appear red and the space between the horizontal lines should appear green. So the question we have and, and had and still have is how might, if I'm wearing this mixed reality device that is interfacing between me and my environment, you know, for hours, minutes or hours or days, whatever, how might adversaries begin to manipulate us in these types of ways. Um, and in fact, actually, I think just on Monday, it might've been yesterday, uh, DARPA announced a new initiative trying to focus on how do we, and we have some other work on this space too, but how do we focus on protecting for the DARPA environment, the, the war fighter from adversarial actions in their mixed, mixed reality displays, but implications also to anyone who's using these devices. Uh, another line of research that I'm very interested in is a better understanding of the security and privacy implications of commercially available images. Um, the image on the right is of a satellite image. What may, came as a surprise to me, but may not surprise some of you, is that for $175, we were able to task a satellite to buy a 75 centimeter resolution image of the University of Washington. And we did this multiple times. Um, so for $175, you can get a satellite image of a region and in work that will appear next year at PETS, Rachel McAmis is leading with Matea Sims and Mia Bennett, who's a geographer. Uh, we try to understand people's perceptions around the security and privacy and implications of this. But for the purposes of the next slide, I'm gonna talk about uh, 3D real estate tours. 
So online real estate companies, for example, Zillow, uh, may include 3D tours of homes. Uh, their, their marketing says that you can get more views, or in general, the field says you can get more views, your homes can sell faster, sell at a higher price, but private information may be visible. And I'll get back to the last bullet in just a moment. Uh, what Rachel did uh, is systematically look through a large number of homes with 3D tours in Zillow and tried to code for the types of uh, information she saw within the home. Uh, we didn't want to include any pictures in our paper, so we worked with an artist, uh, Akira Ohiso, to draw kind of in close to close approximations, but not precise to some of the images we see. So for example, in, in the home, we saw some certificate thanking someone for 45 years, for some number of years of service, full name and work history, uh, you know, a thing that was signed with work history and colleagues' names, uh, possible resident photo. And this particular resident on their computer, I think it was next to their computer, they had their full credit card information, uh, including uh, expiration date uh, and the CCV code, probably because they were using it for, for purchases. That information was on the Zillow tour. And, uh, <laughs> okay, one of the important takeaways, and remember I said that it's important to think about not just the user, um, this risk seems to be disproportionate based, uh, based on my assessment. So for example, uh, people who rent might not know when the homeowner decides to enter the vicinity and make a 3D Matterport scan with the intent to later sell it. And so we saw evidence of this situation arising. Uh, and through the course of, of, of the work, Rachel identified a large number of classes of, of personal information. So, for example, saw anxiety and seizure medication, cholesterol medication, uh, lots of important numbers, healthcare count numbers, and others, um, you know, political affiliation, article Clinton or posters for Donald Trump, and so on and so forth. So, the implications of this work, I believe, are implications to 3D real estate. Uh, but also to the continued presence of cameras in private spaces. So for example, these are the types of issues I think we need to think about when people might start walking around with, you know, I keep going to the head, but I'm like, you know, mixed reality devices on their head. On the technical side, the last bit I want to talk about is um, community. The community is growing. When I start, I mean, I'm, I wasn't there at the beginning of the security research field. So, you know, my, my own involvement began in the very late 1990s. And so I know work predates me, but even in my amount of time in the security field, we've seen the field grow quite significantly. Um, when this community was smaller, I feel like it was a lot easier to get started figuring out how to tackle tough ethical or moral <laughs> questions. You know, the PC meetings are small, everyone talked with each other, everyone knew kind of what everyone else was going on by some approximation. As the computer security research community gets larger, and as people enter the security research domain from other domains, one of the questions that I have, and I think other people have as well, is that how can we help best help new members learn to navigate challenging moral questions in computer security research when they might be encountering it for the very first time versus in the prior community where everyone was, it was so small and there's a lot of kind of conversation and sharing of knowledge. So I'm gonna now start about, talk about work uh, done with Yasemin Ajar and Wolf Lowe. Uh, Yasemin uh, is another security researcher, Wolf is a moral philosopher. And we've been trying to, over the course of a number of efforts, but trying to develop mechanisms and tools to help computer security research community members uh, better reason through and think about uh, ethics and morality. And in doing so, we came up with a number of scenarios that are inspired by the trolley problem scenario. If you're familiar with it, and if you're not, that's okay, I can still describe this scenario. So here, imagine that you are a researcher in the following scenario. You are studying the computer security properties of a wireless implantable medical device, a device that is known to extend the lives of patients by at least 10 years. You find a vulnerability that if exploited, big if, could cause significant harm. Question is, what should you do? Options typically include notify the manufacturer or uh, notify the government or you know, go public through the press release or whatever. Like these are the options. I'm not saying I advocate for any of them, but these are the broad options. But now let me say that the company that made the medical device no longer exists. Uh, it went bankrupt. And therefore it is impossible to patch the vulnerability. Also suppose that many patients have their devices in their bodies 
and the devices are still being implanted in new patients. Um, up at the top, it says some details may not reflect reality. This is more the thought experiment, not necessarily to reflect this is actually what might happen. Um, and because the manufacturer no longer exists for a, this thought experiment, we will limit your choices to you must choose between disclosing the vulnerability to everyone uh, or to no one at all. And now let me add to this by saying that the likelihood of an adversary, adversary actually exploiting the vulnerability is extremely low. We can ex assume zero for analysis purposes, regardless of whether or how you disclose the vulnerability. So the vulnerability exists, but effectively no one will ever exploit it, no matter what. So what do we do? We can set this up as a, a binary problem. Again, this figure might look like a trolley problem if you've seen it before, and if not, that's okay. There's two options. If you choose not to disclose the vulnerability, then patients have no awareness that their device is vulnerable. Patients keep and or proceed with obtaining the device and they receive significant health benefits. And recall that we've assumed that there's no likelihood of exploitation for this thought experiment. Alternately, if you disclose the vulnerability, now patients have the choice not to receive or to remove the device. So we've empowered them with consent and we've empowered them with choice. Um, however, there's a risk of psychological harm if patients know they have a vulnerable device, even if the chances of exploitation is zero. And there's a risk to health harms if patients do not receive or do not remove the device. What would you do in this situation? Um, we've created informal polls, and the reality is people choose different answers. And if we were to draw back to ethics and moral philosophy, we've designed this scenario such that the first option, not to disclose, resonates most with a utilitarianism or consequentialist analysis of what is right or wrong, whereas if you disclose, resonates more with a deontological analysis, people have the right to know, people have the right to inform consent. And so that kind of explains why uh, people might be choosing different answers. And so all of this brings to the point that ethics is hard and within our community, very oftentimes I see people argue over what they believe is right without actually realizing they're centering different values. And so our work is kind of in this broad space of communicating, communicating and thinking about ethics and morality. Okay, let's rewind. Um, so for exercise one, we've thought about technologies. For exercise two, something that I would encourage you to think about even after the talk, is for the technologies that you considered for exercise one, uh, do the previous examples trigger any new thoughts about possible computer security and privacy uh, or other risks? And again, for the previous examples and for your thoughts here, um, security and privacy research findings are sometimes of academic interest, meaning the risk of no risk to people in practice, and other times the findings are of practical interest with real risks that need to be addressed. My philosophy is that both contribute new knowledge uh, and are worth exploring, at least uh, in, in, the, in the security research domain. Okay, so stepping back uh, and understood that if people need to have someplace to be at 110, you absolutely uh, should go. Um, stepping back, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what threat modeling is for those of you who might be interested in exploring computer security research, either as a research domain or as um, elements within your own research. But I want to acknowledge that threat modeling means different things to different people. Uh, and threat modeling also means different things in industry than it does in academia. For the purposes of this talk, threat model modeling refers to an approach used by some security researchers, myself included, to try to anticipate security and privacy risks. And I use it for idea generation. And, uh, you know, similar to other domains, you would probably use similar methods for idea generation. The variables of threat modeling are the stakeholders, who are the direct and importantly indirect stakeholders uh, with respect to the system. What are the assets that one might wish to protect and how valuable are those assets? Who are the adversaries uh, and why might they attack the system? And the adversaries might also be stakeholders. What are the benefits of the system to the stakeholders when there is no adversary present? Uh, and what are the harms uh, to stakeholders when there are no adversaries present. This is important for the conversation. Um, but then vulnerabilities, how might the system be weak? Threats or what are the actions an adversary might take to exploit the system? Uh, for example, a vulnerability might be weak pins, uh, uh, the uh, you know, four digit pins, the threat might be the adversary tries all possible pins. Um, what are the benefits of the system to stakeholders if an adversary manifests? Uh, and what are the harms if an adversary manifests? 
Then we think about the risks. What are overall risks to the stakeholders? Uh, what is the likelihood of an adversary manifesting? The likelihood of a vulnerability being present? And what are the impact of stakeholders if the assets are compromised? Uh, and then we think about these risks from the perspective of each stakeholder group. Again, not thinking about all for each stakeholder group. And then the idea generation drives the research deep dives that we use. Another tool we use uh, is the security cards. And I have, I mean, I'll leave one or two. I brought three, so I'll leave some here. Uh, but this is a tool developed by Tamar Dinning, Bacha Friedman, uh, and myself at UW that is a brainstorming tool intended to help people think broadly uh, about security and privacy assets, risks, and adversaries. So exercise three, pick one of the technologies from exercise one, uh, fast forward five to 20 years and think about the stakeholders, the assets, the adversaries, the vulnerabilities, uh, the benefits and harms. Okay, so last, uh, last, last slide. Again, the future is up to us. What are the new technologies we might see? What might their security risks be and how might these technologies interact with people? Uh, and I believe there is significant value in proactively trying to identify these future technologies, studying early examples of them. For example, we studied cars before autonomous vehicles uh, became a thing. Uh, and then using the results of this uh, research to inform additional research uh, as well as policy and industry activities. Uh, so with that, I will stop. Thank you. Okay. Great to see my talk. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience here and also online in the Q and A. I will not be offended if there are no questions, Sorry. or we could do a brainstorming activity on your exercise one. Yeah, I have a question about the prospects for the future. If I, I, you you played out great examples of using this type of attack paper, and but are we living in a in a period of time where the number of technologies that we could consider is just in the thousands that are, that are appearing in our homes and everywhere. And so maybe my question is just, do you think that the security community can win? Yeah, next? it's a good question. Do I need to repeat it? Like, is it, was that audible over it Zoom? It should be audible. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, you know, it's a really, it's a really interesting question. So the, the challenge is, I guess the way I would put it is um, trying to figure out the right visual, but I'm, I'm imagining like a laser shining into space. And this laser is this direction of the future technology and it's pointing in the wrong direction and we want to move it. Um, if we try to move it at the very ends, maybe with like a mirror, we might move some things. But what we really want to do is we want to go back to the source and we want to like, you know, how our technology is created. Um, we actually did this in the automotive space in the sense that uh, instead of doing, there's an expression, hitting things one at a time, whatever, there's an expression uh, where we didn't work with just like one manufacturer and then the other manufacturer and the other manufacturer and the other manufacturer. We went back up to the source and tried to talk with the Department of Transportation and others, like how do we change this industry? And so, but I believe you completely that we see so many technologies being innovated in so many ways. It's kind of like playing a game of catch up. And so uh, the point being is that we will continue to have to play this game of catch up because technologies will continue to be changing. But what I want to be thinking about is how can we start, how can we continue to try to change structure such that we kind of cut them off at the source? Uh, that's a challenging, that's a challenging endeavor, but like educational activities, like, you know, the, the master's program in security here and all, elsewhere, it's all about uh, kind of going earlier and earlier in thinking about security, but it is a big challenge. Just riffing off that as well, what do you think from your perspective are the technologies on your radar that you're kind of most worried about in the next five to 10 years? Ah, uh, it is a good question. You know, I feel like, uh, and somehow I don't feel super unique in saying this, but uh, these whole generative AI system <laughs> is something that I think a lot of people are talking about. Um, I also am as well. Uh, I am particularly interested in the intersection between, for example, I don't know what these, you know, I'm, not a, I'm still playing catch up myself. I'm learning about language models and generative AI, but I would say like, I would be very interested in the intersection between some of these language models and 
uh, for example, mixed reality systems or things that have some physical component on it. So, so there was not just, you know, large language models, but like where, so where, where will these applications take us? It's something I'm thinking about, but I don't have the answer yet. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have a somewhat related question. So as researchers were sometimes looking ahead at these new technologies, but it seems when we bring up the security and privacy risks, sometimes we get pushed back because people say things like, oh, this isn't deployed yet, or I'm not convinced this is a real problem. And it seems like to me that sometimes actually people need to get hurt before people take the, the problem seriously. And I wish there was a way to take to attack the problems first before there's yeah. real harm in the real world. And I don't know if you have any suggestions for framing research or picking problems that can do just that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. What I would say is um, I completely, I, I, you know, if I, if I heard correctly, I completely agree with what you said. Um, it sometimes takes an example of something to make people realize that the thing that we said might happen actually could happen. Uh, the way that we have approached that, this is kind of why we experimentally studied cars, for example, is because we knew people were talking about security of cars. We wanted something to point to about the risks that would get people to listen in ways that just saying there could be adversaries. So, you know, it was a big substantial difference. I uh, can't remember exactly which meetings happened in which order, but having people from the manufacturer come to our university and we demonstrate on their car that we can do a certain thing that we shouldn't be able to do. Uh, so that was that was a way to change things. Um, but it's, you know, okay, so now I'm not a psychologist and I'm you know not a philosopher, but I'm not many things. But one thing I would say is my impression is that uh, when presented with multiple futures, people like to believe the future that they want to believe in. And, you know, so, you know, that kind of takes people in different, uh, you know, so if they don't want to believe that an adversary might manifest, you know, that's hard to convince them. So how do we go about providing some evidence that would then help convince them to change their, change their view? And experiments are one, one example of that. Yeah, I think climate change is the obvious example about how it until it's a disaster, nothing happens. But, but uh, I want to ask a question about culture of fields. So, uh, and I'll contrast the field I know well, which is HCI, human computer interaction, where the mindset is everyone's good, everyone shares, everything is, we're benefiting society versus, say, the economics, where it's uh, people are out for themselves, or computer security, where it's adversarial system. And there's benefits to HCI being very pie in the sky, uh, positive about humanity. I think it helps them develop things that might not otherwise be developed, but it also means that at the start, these things are never considered. So I guess, do you have some thoughts on culture of different fields and and how that can be bridged so that we aren't waiting to the last minute for security concerns? Ah, this is a really interesting question. Actually, uh, uh, I don't know if you know Katarina Reinecke uh, at UW, but she and I, uh, uh, with Dan Grossman and others are having a, an effort on trying to, you might have seen her last, I don't know, last year she had a Kai paper uh, on uh, basically helping people envision unanticipated consequences. And, you know, unanticipated consequences might be, I design a technology, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard that one of the unintended consequences of, uh, you know, the this camera app at one point was me, being able to use it as a flashlight. I don't know if that's a folklore or not, but that's an example of unanticipated consequences. And so, I know she's working on how can we help people envision unanticipated consequences more proactively. And um, one, of the, one of the exercises, and one of the reasons I like giving this type of talk is that I think having examples of things that are surprising can sometimes help uh, in people realizing that, okay, wait, maybe there's some other surprising way that this might be used. Um, I don't know if this really fully answers your question, but I would love to chat about this more because I think it is, it is really, uh, it's a really good question. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about your work with like government industry and how sort of after you identified the vulnerabilities in the automobile case or any of the cases, how you identified who you wanted to talk to and- Ah, it's an interesting question. Um,
it was somewhat roundabout, and I'm happy to talk, but I think maybe maybe I'll prefer after the after the recording stops. <laughs> just, just, because, just because it was a, a, it's particularly interesting, uh, boring, uh, but a particular 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 pathway that. Uh, but maybe what I would say is stepping broadly back. Um, maybe maybe another answer to your question uh, is that when we approach domains that are not already familiar with security, the process of disclosure includes both an education component and a disclosure component. Because, uh, you know, an industry that has never had to deal with security vulnerabilities in the past, like, they don't know how to process it. They don't know how it's important. They've seen security in the news. And so they know that there's a potential ish issue with their company or government or whatever being in the news. But like, so there's a process of education as well as a process of disclosure that both happen, uh, to, that have to happen together when we approach a new industry. And, or uh, like, you know, the NHTSA at the time, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration didn't have security people, uh, if my memory was correct. And so there was, you know, a lot of education involved. Yeah. So as previously mentioned, there are so many more technologies that we don't see that are being built and will be used in the future. How are you then deciding and evaluating what problems are the most um, dire to address or um, most potentially harmful? Are you working with social scientists to evaluate like what problems you should address? Or are you making those decisions for yourself and then assessing from there? Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it is, it is a really, really good question. Um, uh, I'm really grateful, actually. Matea Sim uh, is a social, a social psychology PhD student doing a postdoc with Francie and me uh, and, and security at UW and Kurt Hugenberg at Indiana University. So we are working with, uh, uh, you, know, you know, with Matea. But what, what I would say is for a lot of the attack work that I did, uh, or that I described, sorry, uh, I often, for me personally, like to look where I don't think other people are looking yet. And you know, like, it's hard to predict exactly, well, no, no one is looking in this space yet, but um, I like to identify areas that are both, I believe, important, but have the potential to be su surprisingly important, if that makes sense, meaning that people aren't necessarily looking at it yet. Um, sometimes I just do it because it's interesting, like the, the bio one, like I don't, it's just, I was just really, really curious. Um, but like the medical device one, I didn't think people were actually doing the type of stuff we were doing, nor the car work, uh, nor the advertising work that I described. Well, I'll put out there, uh, I guess what was a successful effort in this space, because I, for a while ago, worked with Dave Wagner and mm -hmm. a student on the voting machine yep. and stuff. And that was a case where I recall that computer scientists were sounding an alarm for yeah. a decade and nothing happened. Yep. And finally, they basically said you have to have paper. Yep. On it. So can you reflect on that, what you know about that process and what worked in that case? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Um, uh, so I don't know if, uh, well, thank you for the introduction. Um, in the sense that in 2003, my, my role with that was in 2003, the source code for the Deeple voting machine was available on the internet. Uh, I was one of the three researchers with, uh, four researchers with Adam Stubblefield, Dan Wallach, and Avi Rubin that analyzed that source code uh, to understand what the vulnerabilities might be with voting machines. And I know we put, you know, we, that was very early in my career and also kind of in the, you know, the security community was still kind of young compared to today. Uh, it, this was an example of having a demonstration of, look, there is these security vulnerabilities in this software that changes a conversation because prior to that my memory was that manufacturers were saying um uh that you know computer scientists are all wrong these devices are fine they're secure but then there was evidence to the contrary um and i should say my role was looking at the software but there were a lot of people dave wagner you know david dill you know I'm, I'm, i shouldn't go into names i'm going to miss some of them but so many more people sending much harder efforts than me uh to have that conversation about voting machines but it still took a long time to get traction. Yeah, yeah. So have you, in your years now of research, come across any design patterns that might shorten that path? Uh, so, okay, so so the question is that design patterns might shorten that path. One of the questions is, 
is there a path towards making it more secure under the current, or secure enough under the current parameters? And so for the voting machine, the parameter, what, you know, if the parameter was elect paperless, if that was the parameter, there wasn't a clear short-term path to achieve it at all. And so sometimes we have to change the parameters and say, you know, we, we have to actually add paper. If there is a path towards making it more secure that is kind of fits within the parameters, then, then the conversation is different. And so I think the voting machine conversation was different because you know, the, the parameter space of what they wanted as a solution versus what other people wanted as a solution was different than the parameter space for like, you know, what does it mean for a car to be secure? But this is kind of off the top of my head. So, you know, I should probably think about that a little bit more. Well, I think that, that that's a great example. And that's sort of a technical solution. There is another solution, right? Which is a, a regulation. Yeah. So if immediately Congress had said, it has to be paper ballots, that's what the experts are telling us will do it. It would have fixed it. And, and I think there's a lot of other yeah. examples like that. Yeah. So, of course, we often don't want to prematurely regulate, but uh, have you thought at all about that relationship between regulation and uh, causing technology changes and the pros and cons? Uh, it's a good question. I've thought about it, but not to the degree to actually have a, you know, this is what I think is the actual answer. Um, I'm not sure why. Maybe I should think about it more, but it is a good question. I do want to think about it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The high school. Yeah, no, it's great. It's a great question. You went online, have a question? Okay, well, I think we should wrap it up. Let's okay. thank you again. Thank you for the really yeah, fascinating. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.